Good afternoon, everybody. It's John Barrows with Jay Barrows Consulting with Make It Happen Mondays here. Hopefully, you all had a fantastic weekend, especially for those fathers out there. I had a great time with my daughter and my family out in California, even though we spent the whole time on the flight home uh, for Father's Day, but it was still with my family, so that's what matters. But uh, this week, hopefully, you all ready to rock. I am super amped up to have my guest today, uh, Kevin Dorsey over at Service Titan. Kevin, why don't you introduce the, yourself to the crowd and talk a little bit about background, what you're coming from, all that stuff. <clears throat> hey, guys. Thanks for hopping on. It's KD. Um, I am the current head of sales development and enablement at Service Titan. We're based like the salesforce.com for the home services industry. A uh, little background on me, and um, I'm, a, I'm a chosen salesperson, not a natural born salesperson. And I've cut my teeth in multiple industries. And I just I found a, a knack and a niche for growing coaching sales teams from small to, to big. And that's what I'm doing at Service Titan now. I love it, man. Because I, you know, your LinkedIn profile um, it talks about how you were a sales development executive of the year, top ten, top one hundred sales coach, and sales consultant and mentor. So, how did you like? You said you were chosen, right? Uh, you, it's a chosen field for you. Why did you choose it? When I was in school, I felt sales was the most secure job you could ever have. I, I convinced myself that if you knew how to sell, that you'd always have a job. And so I decided to get into it. I was not natural. I am more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. And I started reading the Zig Ziglers and the Brian Tracy's knocking on doors. I sold, I didn't even sell Cutco knives. I sold the, the knockoff of Cutco knives in college. So like, and I sucked. I was really bad and worked my way up to figure things out. And I think that's why I have such a passion for coaching because I didn't have no one, no one really sat me down to teach me. I had to really learn it on my own. I think that's why I try so hard to give my teams as much as I can so they don't have to go through all the struggles that I did. Love it, man. I mean, this is why I'm, I'm so excited for this conversation because I think you and I share a very similar outlook on stuff. I mean, I, I fell into sales, <clears throat> didn't have a lot of coaching, figured it out along the way. And the reason I trained today is exactly what you just said there is like I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I'm hopefully just hope, you know, helping a rep skip a few steps, right? Not all the steps. They still got to get punched in the face. They still got to learn it, yeah. but hopefully a little bit of guidance will at least put them in the right direction. Right? Exactly. I believe I've talked about this before. I think sales as an industry loses really good potential people because they don't get through the first three years. Yeah. If you make it through the first three years, like you, you've gotten punched in the face a little bit. You've bounced back up. You've gone through it. But we lose a lot of really good potential people that didn't get through those first three years. It was too hard. They weren't taught how to avoid the the hooks or the jabs, like all those things add up. And so they go into marketing and they go into customer success and we lose them. And I think that's where I found a little bit of a niche with this sales development world. Like I love the closing side. I'd still miss closing from time to time. But like to try to get people through these first three years of like make sales a great career is what I'm really passionate about right now. Yeah, and, and just for all those grads out there listening to this podcast on the back end, I, I couldn't agree with Kevin more as far as sales being the most secure job that you could have. Because if you think about technology right now, it's disrupting every industry. So there could be a, like AI could all of a sudden point its eye at, okay, sorry, industry, we just annihilated your skill set for this. But if you sell into that industry, then all you got to do is kind of go into another industry and sell for that industry. You just got to learn how to sell that product. You don't have to be certified in said skill set to be able to, like, there's a lot of people out there that when technology disrupts that market, now they got to go back to school effectively, right? Yeah. Our sales is pretty universal. So I love it, man. In line with, I think what we're talking about today around humanizing it with, with sales is most of what I read and study now is on humans. It's not on skills. It's on people, biology, psychology, neurotransmitters, hormones. Like, what, what about people? That's how you sell. And if you really learn people, you can move industry to industry. But when people learn how to sell in an industry, and mm -hmm. well, person, that's when they get in trouble because then they can't switch. They're right. like, oh, I, I, I can't sell X because I only learned how to sell Y. Versus once you get people, it opens up the whole world. I always say that it doesn't. So I had actually a little backdrop here. I know we're a little sidebar, but 
<clears throat> when I got fired from Staples. So I was an IT sales guy for my first startup and we ran that, got it to 12 million purchased by Staples. They fired me because I, I couldn't get along in the corporate world. Um, but uh, I, and then I had a little bit of a crisis as far as like, what do I, what do I do next? Cause I was like, well, am I an IT sales guy? I'm like, I, I don't, I don't even like computers. Like I, I, I can't, like, I don't know anything, like, but I sold IT, I sold computers for seven years or IT support. And my wife was the one who got me to help me realize, she's like, well, let's take a look at every job you've had and why you've been successful at each one of them, right? So DeWalt power tools. Why was I the top rep at DeWalt? Cause I love DeWalt power tools. Like DeWalt power tools were badass. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't hard for me to have that conversation with people. Xerox copiers. Why was I, well, it's not, I didn't love copiers, but I believed Xerox was the best company at the time in that space. Thrive, why was I great there? It didn't have to do with the technology, it had to do with the people. So right, what right. the realization was, is it didn't matter what I sold. It just mattered that I believed in what I sold. Absolutely. And then it opened up the floodgates to pretty much any career, right? So, I mean, well, any any industry, as long as I can believe in it. So, love it. So let's talk about it because I think this because this is the topic, right? Humanizing sales. What does that mean to you based on where we are right now? Because I think we could look at it from a historical standpoint of humanizing sales. But what is in today's world with technology and AI and all that other stuff? What does it actually mean to humanize sales from your perspective? I think it's when it comes to humanizing sales, it's what can technology and automation not do mm -hmm. to a human being. And I think that's what it means to me is if we look at what it means to be human, most of, if you look at what separates us from, call it the animals, and what separates us from technology is emotion. Yep. Humans have emotions. we happy, sad, frustrated, all of those things. And to humanize means like intentional work to elicit the emotions you want from the people you're talking to, whether that's joy or pain whether it's curiosity it's bringing the emotional side back to selling because that's something that technology can't do technology at the moment right who knows eventually but right. cannot it's emotion and do that's you still, what that do you still believe because because historically everybody's always said people buy on emotion back it up with fact do you still believe that i do i think where people get lost is people make decisions with emotion. They don't necessarily buy off emotion, but we, okay. we make decisions emotionally, right? That's how you can have like, and anyone that's sold knows this. You can talk to a prospect on a Monday and they're like, get lost. That's it. I don't want to talk to you. I'm done. And they hit you up on a Thursday and say, you know what? We're ready to go. Right. Nothing changed logically. The logic was still there, but the decision to buy is still based off emotion. Now, the ability to buy, that's where logic comes in. Do I have the money? Can I prove an ROI? Yes, I want this thing. I love it. But does it actually make sense? That's where logic comes in. But people don't buy through emotion. They make the decision to buy through emotion. I like that. And which one do you think? Because I get that. I'm sure you get this question a lot. I get it all the time which is like creating urgency, right? How do you create urgency um, when it's seemingly not there, right? So yeah, inbound leads, there's, a, you know, I need this problem solved, whatever it is, but creating urgency, I think is one of the hardest things to do in sales. Do you think it's what mix or, or what approach from a, an emotional versus factual standpoint do you take when it comes to creating urgency? I believe, I mean, urgency in itself is an emotion, yeah. right? Like it's a need with a timeline addressed to it. And the biggest way you affect urgency is by making someone want what you have. Yeah. If you make someone want it, the more you make them want it, the faster they will want to get it done, right? I talked about this with my old teams, I talked about it here. You can't create urgency for someone who doesn't want what you have. Right. right? Deadlines, discounts, promos, whatever. If I don't want it, none of that matters. And so it's the creation of the want that we have to focus on. And the better job we do there, then want leads to need, need leads to ROI, ROI leads to what's missing if you don't move forward by X. But if I don't want it, like I, this was a couple of weeks ago, I had someone attempt a takeaway sale on me. Um, they're like, well, if we can't get this done by Friday, like the pricing I offered you will no longer be valid. And I said, okay, 
Okay. Like I, I'm not buying anyway. So I don't want what you have. So your urgency doesn't matter to me. It just yeah. make me want it. That's how you do it. Well, and this is why the, the discount sale is always the saddest way to sell, right? Because yeah. it, it, it ruins your credibility across the board because you usually a rep has done a pretty decent job up until a point, maybe showing the value and it's like, okay, cool. And then look, we'll probably buy, but all of a sudden you get that call. The end, hey, if you, if you sign by the end of the month, First of all, it ruins your credibility. But second of all, everybody knows that damn discount doesn't go away at the end of the month. Cool. Right. So I, I've told this to a rep before where they tried to pull that same shit on me and be like, OK, fine. I'll just wait till the end of next month. And then, like, uh, uh, because I know it'll be there next month. So, like, that's why selling on value and, and, and trying to create that is way better than selling that discount. Right. Um, what, how do you coach people on, on discounts, like how and when to use them? So it depends on the sale, but regardless of the sale, I always, always, always cover, do not cover pricing with someone who doesn't want what you have. Yep. So that, that's my first rule. If they don't want it, there's no reason to talk pricing. So there's rule number one. And then rule number two, if they can't explain why they want it, they're not ready to discuss pricing. At that point, I actually like to bake in discounts up front, right? Yep. Or it's like, all right. So, hey, before we dive into pricing, do you want this? Like, is, is this something that you actually want for your business? Yes. Okay. Why? Why for you? Because some people want it for this. Some people want it. Why do you want this for your business? Now they're selling themselves back to you, right? Law of consistency. Yeah. All right. Let's dive into pricing. Because I'm also anchoring ROI throughout the presentation, right? So now at this point, it's saying, all right, so it's going to be $1,000 a month. If we can get this done by next Friday, I can knock it down to twelve hundred or you know eight hundred dollars a month, and that's going to come with X, X, and X. Do we think we can get it done by there? So what I'm doing is I'm taking away the back and forth. This is what helps shorten the sales cycle. I'm going to give you the discount because it also is proven emotionally. How do people feel about receiving discounts? They like it. <laughs> feel good. This is why corporations run sales. I actually believe in discounting. But it okay. should be baked into your pricing. It should be okay. baked in discount because it actually does make people feel good. People like knowing they got a better deal. Yep. Don't, but I've all generally speaking, I've had like flat rate discounts. And like this is what the discount is. Right, right. It isn't a negotiation, it's just this is the discount and let's go. So that's kind of like so when I talk about objection handling. It's almost like, so the, the close technique that you talk about, the walkaway close, but then the objection handling technique, which I love, which is the preemptive strike, where you know it's going to be an objection. So before you allow them to use it, you use it, right? And you take their power away. By, you know by, what call you know, that, right? What's that? You know what we call that here? What's eight that? miling. Eight mile? Eight miling. Remember eight mile? Yeah. Eminem? The last scene is one of the most classic examples of how to handle objections in the history of the world. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And he comes out, he's like, yeah, I'm white, I'm skinny, I'm an idiot, you know, that, and he starts like, it just. Every new onboarding class yep. watches the last scene of 8 Mile when we do our objection training. We call it 8 Mile because it is like, take what you know, yep. they're going to say, use yep. it against them. But then the second part, right, if you remember that scene, he says all the bad shit he's going to say. Then he flips it and he goes, yeah. I know something about you and he goes there. So it's the handle the objection, but then take what you know about the person you're talking to and leverage it forward. So yeah, preemptive strike. I like eight miling. That's, that's, that's what I thought. That's, that's a better way. To I, I got baked into my, my slide deck, but I like the eight mile exa example there. Cause I remember that real well. Um, cool, man. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I wanted to talk about this one main example cause this really hit home for me. Like you and I, we're, we're chatting about this earlier, where the sales process almost lost and potentially lost the deal for you. And and th and I got this question after I posted this little example here, which was the sophisticated buyer. How do you identify a sophisticated buyer? So it kind of dovetails into humanizing sales, right? Because look, we're all, every sales rep is, you know, they got to learn the slide deck. They got to learn the corporate deck. They got to learn, you know, whatever's in the sales manual, all that stuff. Like that's the onboarding part of it, right? But I always tell people, like, if you can't all this, if you can't make that your own and if you can't now take that and put some context around this to the buyer and be human about that presentation, that process, there's a strong possibility you're going to turn off more people than you're going to turn on. And look, I understand the unsophisticated buyer. 
Like the person that doesn't know, you know, and is usually below the power line being told what to do. Hey, go, go look into something like this. Okay, fine. Bring you through the whole demo, whatever. I still disagree with that approach of, of just going through the 30 slide deck, you know, soup to nuts. But let's talk about the sophisticated buyer. Like somebody like you and me, who we've done our homework, we're executives within our companies. Time is of the essence, right? So walk me through this scenario again, without naming any names of what happened to you. And then let's talk about how do we identify the person like you versus the person that's just calling up for pricing. So walk us through this, what happened first, and then let's talk about how to identify that scenario. For sure. And this is by far and away, not an isolated incident. I actually have another process going on right now where it's the exact same thing. Uh, I was looking into a software for my team. There's a couple competitors like in the landscape. And so obviously I've researched before I've even reached out to these companies. I've already done back channel references. I've already talked to people that are using them. I understand the concept. I've even looked at both of these companies over the past couple of years. So I saw one and they actually, they started off with like, well, what do you need to see? Like, what do you need to see? And I was like, here's what I need to see. And they showed me what I needed to see and sprinkled in some questions throughout it. I was like, all right, cool. So I end there. I go to another company where I'd actually was kind of leaning towards them from the beginning. You know, I do some things. I had some good back channel um, references. All right, cool. But this time, they I, I even remember this. I got the calendar invite, and it was for... 30 minutes and said, Hey, you know, we're going to go through some stuff, blah, 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 blah. I'll learn more about your business, this and this and that. And then we can set up a demo. And I responded back to that. And I said, no, I don't need 30 minutes of discovery. I'm already moving forward with this. I just need to see some key examples. Okay. Now this was called their first mistake. They said, okay. So yeah. my take okay. into that call was I was going to get what I wanted. Wasn't the case. I got discovered for 20 minutes. It lasted them only 10 minutes at the end to even show me their product. And at that point, two things were in my head. Either I was like, all right, screw this. Like, I, this was your shot. You didn't get it. I'm moving on. But I threw a olive branch. I said, you know what? Stop rushing because he was flying. I'm here. Fly. <laughs> Let's set up another one. Set up another one. Let's go. And so we set up another one. This was for an hour. Multiple people are now on this call. And same thing. They're going through the same process. I can tell it's the same deck showing me everything. When the whole point of this was, tell me how you're different from the other person. I understand your value prop. I understand the value I could see. I understand, but I'm making a decision now. Show me the difference. And even that didn't go very well. <laughs> Here's the problem I have with discovery. So I have a rule on questions. Don't ask questions you're not going to use to close. Okay. So if you discover me, then you should be using that throughout your whole presentation. But most prospects, you ask all these discovery questions, and I don't get – they're not used. You gave me the same presentation you used with someone else. Right. So those, that was an example of I like almost said no just because of how the sales process was. I was forced to sit through something that I didn't need to. And so back to, I guess, the original question is how, one of the questions, like, how do you discover if someone's a sophisticated buyer? You ask them. You ask them. Yeah. You say, hey, where are you in the buying process right now? Mm -hmm. Are you 7% of the way, like CEB says you are by the time you reach out to me, or are you at 74%? Yeah. And you ask. But then here's how you weed out the people you were talking about is you ask them to explain what they've learned so far. Okay. Right? So, hey, Kevin, where, where are you at right now in terms of this process? You know, I've done a lot of research. I've even called some of your, your customers. I guess, so, all right, so you understand the overall value that X can bring to your company. Yes, I do. What do you think that is for you? Now, again, you have me pre-selling you on, well, here's what I believe the return will be. Now you can say, all right, so what do you need to see for me to confirm yeah. those things? You can, the, 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 the sales process should, is not linear. I almost want a whiteboard right now. Everyone who knows that whiteboard, whiteboard. Yeah. It's not a straight line, right? It's a connect the dots that eventually equals like a dollar sign. So you can ask your discovery questions that are extra throughout the presentation. 
Because the other thing too, and I'm sure you've gotten this, when you ask all your discovery questions up front, you know that leads to on the demo, no good questions, right? Because you've already kind of asked them. So now I'm just sitting there listening. So they just have to ask better questions than actually use it. Actually use it. It's it's a you know I wrote a post a long time ago called "Sell to the Twenty Percent," which is my firm belief. They pick a product or service that you own, right? I, I almost guarantee you only use about 10 to 20% of the functionality, whatever that product or service is, right? I use the iPhone as the example, right? It's like, you know, this thing has more power than we used to send somebody to the moon, but most people check emails, text, Snapchat, whatever, right? So because most people only use 10 to 20% of the functionality, whatever it is they're buying, that's how I believe people buy. They only buy the 10 to 20%. Now we think the whole presentation is important because that's what we were badged for boot camp. But really the only thing you give a shit about is show me this, right? And if I could show you that, now all of a sudden I hone in on that. I figure out what your priorities are around that with like what happens if you don't do that, whatever. But that's what I'm selling to. Do you agree with that kind of philosophy? There? Well, one, that's that was my presentation at Rainmaker this past year at sales law. And like I was on stage quoted big bold letters, stop selling your whole product. Yep. Be, not what everyone is buying. I'm trying to remember the book is from. It was it's a consumer psychology book. And what they found was people buy for one to two reasons. Any purchase, any purchase, they buy for one to two reasons and justify with one to two more. That is it. That is four total reasons why you make any purchase in your life. From a cheeseburger to a hundred and thirty thousand dollar Porsche. You bought that Porsche for two reasons. How it makes you feel pulling up to the office and you want to beat the Mustang off the line. You yeah. justified it with two more. Well, it is a German made vehicle, so it's safer. And I really do like red and how it affects my skin tone. That is it. Everything else was gone. That's why you bought. You have to find what those one to two things are. And remember, they were, the things I mentioned, they were feelings, not features. The top two reasons why I bought were for feelings. And then I justified with the other things. What are you looking for? If I'm talking to you, right? What's the feeling I want? Because I'm working with John Barrows. Mm -hmm. yep. That feeling. Well, it's funny because, and, and you know this world, right? Is is I get the ROI question a lot by somebody, and usually it's not from the VP or SVP. It's almost always from the person that's below the power line checking off the boxes. Well, what kind of ROI does your training provide? And I'm like, do you really want to have this conversation? Fine. Then what's the exact conversion ratio you have to you? Top tier accounts using email to C-level executives. What's that number? And I'll tell you what they are. Nobody has that number. That's a number they're looking to check a box. The question is, is are you trying to drive results? Are you trying to, in a lot of cases with training specifically, they want to show their team they've invested in them. Mm -hmm. Right. So they want to have the good feeling that their team comes out of that training jazzed up, fired up. And ultimately, yeah, if they have some techniques and tips that will move the dial, that's like almost gravy. on Like that's almost like the icing on the cake. But mm -hmm. if you were to really ask most VPs when they invest in training, I, I would say at least 50 percent of them are going to say, yeah, I just want to I, I want to have my team feel like we're investing in them. Right. And right? so the team feel what's the feeling that. I want, right? I want my team to feel like I'm investing. But what's the feeling I'm looking for in that? It's security. It's confidence, right? It's like almost like a lack of fear. Like, hey, I am investing in my team, right? It's that feel first. And then everything is, oh, well, yeah, I need to level up my team and I have to do all those things. But that that's the, we we're talking about before, that emotion and logic. Yep. Emotion does come first. And if you never find it, if you just sell on logic, this is why, like spin selling is a great, I love spin. I love it. Yeah. Spin is a very, very heavy logic based sale. Right. If this situation and problem, right, solutions over here, buy. They, they miss out on the stories, they miss out on the feelings that got people to where they are now. 
Well, that's also so. Let's let's explore that one too because like the pain funnel, right? So let's talk Sandler because I'm a big Sandler fan. I'm a big Spin fan, right? But I almost call bullshit on the pain funnel here because it's like, okay, you know, what's the primary pain? Oh, we're not going to hit our numbers. What happens? Well, if we don't hit our numbers, we're not going to hit the, you know, get the next funding round. Well, what happens to you personally if that, well, I'm going to lose my job. And the whole concept there is if I get to that, that's what I can sell to. But sophisticated buyers going to that one, like I can tell when a rep's pull me through that. And that's, yes, that's a data point. Like if I don't hit my numbers, blah, blah, blah. But that ain't the real reason I'm buying this shit. No. And if a rep tried to pull that back on me and be like, dude, whatever, like the time back, you know, the time back, well, Kevin, if I could give you three hours a week of time back, well, then what, you know, it's like, I don't know, I'd do something else with those three hours, like, you know, whatever. So what's your kind of theory on, on where that fits in the overall justification process, if you will? So pain is important, right? Like, and the results of the pain are important. But again, there's a massive flaw in all of that that assumes human beings are logical. We are not logical. Anyway. We, we are the That's my friend. Are, of dissonance. <laughs> we are the only creature on this planet that intentionally does things we know are bad for us. Intentionally. Yep. So all this logic-based thing, like we think pain moves people. Pain doesn't. We do things that hurt us all the time. Mm -hmm. Anyone that's watching this can say anyone ever maybe been in a relationship that they shouldn't have been in and mm -hmm. stayed for too long, even though logically there was a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. That's why like going for pain in a sales process isn't all you can rely on because that's that is pure logic. Oh, it hurts, so you should change it. Right. It doesn't work. You also have to get me to envision the future. You have to get me to envision the better version of myself. It's not just the avoidance of pain, which does move people, but you got to give me that brighter future too. And like with my reps, we, we focus more on gaps than pain. Now, it depends on the, the type of sale that you're in, especially early on in the sales process, which I don't think a lot of people think about. How does pain make people react? What are the two reactions to pain? Mm -hmm. There's technically a third, but you got fight, flight, or learned help are pretty much the whole how you respond to pain. Okay. I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to invoke fight or flight early on in a sales process. <laughs> no. <laughs> and that's how people try to discover very early on. They're trying to find the pain. Well, now who do I associate that pain to? You, the salesperson. I don't feel good interaction interacting with you. So I'll leave that session with a purely logical example of, yes, I have a problem, but I don't feel good. Yeah. And now I'm not going to want to take that next step. You got to get both emotions into it. Yeah. We talk a lot about when I do training, we talk about pain and pleasure, right? Like, and that's also, and this kind of, will get to our kind of a last question here, which is the, the sophisticated buyer, because I look at pain and pleasure like this. The reason that I think so many people are fixated on pain is because a lot of times we sell to people below the power line. And people below the power line are focused on today or yesterday, which is usually pain, whereas people above the power line are focused on tomorrow, which is usually pleasure. So going back to the sophisticated buyer, like I don't want to talk about pain. If I want to talk about pain, I would have submitted an inbound lead and told you I have pain fix this for me. But if you're trying mm -hmm. to sell me on something and get me to buy something bigger picture, you got to figure out a way to get me up, for instance, for me to get off an airplane so I could spend more time with my daughter. Like if you can figure if you can s figure anything out that is going to help me spend more time with my daughter, I will listen to anything you have to buy and I will spend whatever money it takes to be able to make that happen. But if you're just going to say, well, John, I know your travel schedule is busy and I can coordinate it more logistically for you and be more efficient with that. It's like, yeah, OK, John, I could give you more time with your daughter. Uh -huh. We're having that conversation. So so let's talk about that sophisticated buyer, though, because I think this is the last piece of this is. You said you said it as far as ask them, right? But there's a lot of sales reps and a lot of buyers, again, usually below the power line, that'll straight up say, look, Kevin, I already know what I'm looking for. Just you know, tell me how much this is going to cost me. And, you know, you and I wouldn't take that approach. We'd, we'd articulate, you know, that type of stuff. But I think there are a lot of people that just push sales reps around. And sales reps like 22, 23, 24-year-old kid is now stuck in a, 
well, I, no, I don't want to give you that pricing, but if I don't give you that pricing, I'm probably going to lose the deal. So what do I do with that kind of aggressive, look, Kevin, I already know what I'm talking about here. I've already done the due diligence. Uh, how much is this going to cost? How do you identify the person that's legit about that versus the one that isn't? And it, does it come back to just asking them like you said before? Yeah, it's not, it's, but it's asking the right questions, right? So how do you determine if someone is actually the buyer? Right. Right. How do you determine if someone's actually the buyer? They're actually the buyer when they before, and you do this all the time. By the time I'm ready to talk to a rep about a product, like actually talk to her about a product, I'm not just dying the, down the buying process. I've also already done ROI. Right. I've already been like, okay, like what would I need to see to make this worth it? Mm -hmm. So that's a question that you can ask, right? Someone's like, well, hey, I need to know the price. It's like, all right, we have a few different options here. What sort of expected ROI are you hoping to see from this? That will expose, right, a whole lot. Either the person that's too low, they're like, well, you know, I need to buy, and they'll discard it. Or you're talking to a you or me. It's like, look, I need to see at least a two, three X. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, now you've already been doing your research. How do you think a product like this? Not just us, because by the time I'm talking to you, I'm talking to other people too which people forget about a sophisticated buyer. Yep. If, if I opted to you, I opted into your three top competitors and you better be ready to have that conversation. Yep. Okay, why do, you think, why do you think sales training will have a positive impact on your company, right. right? Some people think it's this, some people think it's this. Why do you think it is? Now we're getting a little bit of exposure to who likes there. Now, this is the last part I'll touch on though. SDR to AE, there's a big difference. There's a Big difference here. If you are the SDR, you need to be brutally honest. Brutally honest. But I can't stand, and my team knows this, they can't do it. When an SDR says, I don't know pricing. Bullshit. You tell me you work at that company in a sales department and you don't know the price of your product? Yeah. You're not allowed to say that, right? You can start with, and it depends, you know, how your product works, but most pricing does depend now. Most pricing does depend on how you choose to leverage it. So we're up front. Like, honestly, it's going to depend on how you choose to leverage this product and where you go with it. We've got some people that spend X. You give them like a low price. You got some people that spend $30,000, $40,000 a month with us. Mm -hmm. But no one's giving us that money for free. It's because they're all seeing a return. Right. Let me set you up with my product expert so we can see what sort of return we can give you in pricing. Right. No, I need to know the price now. Okay. So you're already convinced, you're already convinced that as a whole, this product's gonna be good for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Well, it comes in normally like $350 per month per seat. But my account executives have different promos and discounts and things they can offer that I can't. Could I set you up with one of them so they can go into it? Right? So I still got a range, right? I still have and a sophisticated buyer. We have an idea. Like, I honestly, I don't know what you charge, Barris. I don't know what you charge. Yep. But I have a decent idea of where you're probably going to fall. Yep. So as long as like, you don't fall way outside of that, that conversation can continue. But you just got to ask. It's just asking the right questions. Well, and I think that's the, from a pricing conversation, similar approach in the sense that, you know, some people say don't talk price at all, build value and then talk price because you've justified it. Others say talk price up front so you don't waste your time, but then you might lose out. I'm similar to you as ballpark. Hey, give give me a couple of like for me, it's how many reps do you have? You know, do you want to do online or on site? That type of stuff. How many different sessions? Those okay, cool. Well, you're probably in the range of thirty to fifty thousand dollars, depending on what is that in the range of what you're looking for? Well, yes, because I do want to know up front, like if, if you were expecting this to be five thousand dollars, okay, sorry, like let's stop talking here. But if you're at least okay to your point, sophisticated buyer kind of understands the, the parameters here, and I throw that number out there and you're like, okay, then we can work on it moving forward. And to you, I I I don't get discounts out of the vocabulary. I don't get I think discount obviously is a part of sales. I try to get the word discount out of the vocabulary and change it to creativity and flexibility. Yeah. Because that allows, the, it's a different conversation because now instead of maybe cutting off, now we add a couple of years longer. Now we add an extra service to it or whatever, but we can get creative and we have flexibility as opposed to discounting, which is just a dollar figure. Yeah. So 
I like it. I think the key there, though, is that you do have other things to add, right? Hey, we, we can get creative here. And it's all you, if all your creativeness was dropping the price. Yeah. Well, that, that wasn't creative. That was, <laughs> I, have, I have an email in my inbox right now, right? Where like, I'm negotiating. I love negotiating. I love yeah. it. It's the only place I get to like close anymore. So like I have a you know, of this. And if any of the people that are trying to sell to me right now are watching this, you know, like <laughs> I'm good at it, but it's there. It's like, yeah. oh, oh, well, what do we do here? I'm like, ah, can we do a little better? Yeah. That was it. That that was it. Well, that's that's what cracked me up about what you said to me of this example where you brought the rep in because this is it. I mean, when you were talking price, you were like, hold still, watch what's about to happen. And could you explain that? Because I think this is this happens to every rep, and I'm gonna coach every. I, I want reps to understand the power of silence, and also what guys like you and me try to do to sales reps without even really trying. So talk like when they did pricing, what did they do? We, we get to the end of the, the second demo, all right? And then we get into price, right? It's like, all right, so how much is this going to cost? And again, I'm down the funnel. I've talked to your number one competitor. I know what they charge. You should too. Yeah. And I ask, what is this? How does pricing work? And they're like, oh, you know, it's a per monthly, blah, 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 blah. There's no implementation fee, da, 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 all, all that. Like, cool, you didn't give me the price. Right. And I can hear them kind of like, oh, OK. And one of my reps is like walking by the room that like I'm, I'm in a room right now. It's got glass, glass doors and everything. So everyone can, can see me. Yeah. And I like I wave them in. Right. And I, I, the phone goes on mute. And they're like, what's up? I'm like, watch what's about to happen here. OK, I'm getting into pricing. And like they're they're still talking. Right. They're still talking on the demo. They don't know this is going on. And I said, I just asked them what the price was. I want you to listen to this. So they finally give me the price. They say, it'll be X amount per month. And I say, oh, and mute, right? Oh, and mute my phone. And I look at my rep and I gave him like the little Jordan Belfort, three, two, and well, but nothing's set in stone and we can get like flexible <laughs> with our, our pricing, but we've never lost one, you know, for, you know, not being able to find like a way to meet like economically. So let me talk to my team here and like, we can figure out what we have to do to get your business. <laughs> Unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So I didn't even have to ask for anything. It was just, I didn't say anything. All I said was, oh, that was it. And I just sat in the silence. And they were not willing to sit in the silence as long as I was, right? It was only like if they were, would you have been cool with that from a pricing standpoint, or like I'd like, yeah, right? Because it was already there. They didn't ask the right question afterwards, right? So the reason why they kept talking is they didn't ask a question. When you drop your price, you need to ask a question right afterwards, right? To like get yourself out of that silence, right? Oh, it's going to be. A hundred dollars a month, based on what you saw today. Do you think you'll see the ROI on that? I like it. Get a, get a question out so you don't say something stupid next. What do you think about this one? Because because you know Richard Harris, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, so like I'm I'm good friends with Richard. I like him a lot. And he started playing around. This he got me thinking about this. Where what he does is going back to feelings and emotions. He'll drop price and immediately ask that question. How does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that approach where it's like, you know, uh, Kevin, it's going to be $10,000. How does that make you feel? You I, love, I love that question. How does that make you feel? Because you're going to get a more honest answer, a right. much more honest answer. And man, I mean, that's genius. I'm writing that down because we do. We have this like as a rule, like we don't ask people how they're doing. That's them how they're feeling. Yeah. Hey, how are you feeling today? Yeah. Not how are you doing today? How are you feeling today? You're going to get a more genuine answer. Yeah. So if you ask someone on the phone, like, yeah, it's a hundred dollars, ten thousand dollars for the training. How does that make you feel? If I respond back with good, yeah, I feel pretty good about that. Yep. Done. There's no, there's no more negotiating. Like, there's it. Ooh, ah, that that sounds a little bit high. Yeah. Okay. Now that's how it sounds. But how does it make you feel? Like, do you feel like that's an unreasonable amount for what yeah. we're giving? Because, and this is where you're exposing the feelings. Because if someone wants it, right? If someone wants it, say, hey, I, I do want it. And like, that's where I was talking was actually with my manager the other day, right? Someone, I was arguing with someone. I argue with people a lot about this shit. 
And they're saying like, budget doesn't matter if value is proven. Budget doesn't matter if that, like, if you can prove enough value, they'll find the budget. And I said, that is not true at all. That there, I've, I've worked at a bootstrap startup. You bootstrap from the beginning. Yes. Yeah, all right, I'm going to get 10x value on this. I don't have a $100,000 check to write you. Right. I don't, I just don't have it. Right. So, no, I think feeling is great there. And then it's knowing what you're going to ask immediately afterwards. So, what I coach my AEs to and my SDRs is what are you going to ask next? Not what are you going to say next? And if I can get you in a question mindset, it takes away you tripping over yourself and giving shit away or fumbling. It's like, what are you going to ask next? So, I feel good. What's your next question going to be? Gotcha. All right. How do we get this contract signed? If they say, ooh, that sounds high, next question. Well, where were you hoping to land, right? Like it's being right at that next question because when salespeople talk is when they get into trouble. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. Well, so therefore what's your, because a lot of people say ask the closing question then shut the hell up. You're saying ask the closing or deliver pricing and then ask a question. So instead of the silence and waiting that out, whoever spurks first loses, blah, blah, blah. You're saying, no, screw that. Like, forget about silence. Come up with a question to solicit a response. Correct. I'm going to okay. put the silence on you. Right. So a salesperson should never end in dead space. Right. So here's the price. Because now what you're doing is you're asking the, the prospect to close themselves. Right. right. So, hey, here's the price. So if all that sounds good, can we get you going today? Now you shut up. You put the silence on them, right? right? And then they have to come back to you with whatever they're going to say. You do have to ask for the clothes, but sure. you got to ask for it and then shut up. You can't just give a price and then shut yeah. up. That won't work. I've always found that awkward. It's like, how much is it? $10,000. Right? Okay. It's just, yeah, it's like, now, and, and by the way, most sophisticated buyers know the game you're playing. And look, I'm, I'm more comfortable in silence than a sales rep is because I don't need the commission, right? So I'll sit here all day if you want me to. You're going to speak first. So sophisticated buyers will call bullshit on that silence game all day long. I like the way you position it, though, because I usually I, I do say, you know, tell the price and then shut up. But it's not like $10,000. Shut up. It's $10,000. You know, here's what's included. And then I actually probably do. I, I haven't thought about it, but I probably do ask that. So how's that make you feel? Or so what are the next steps from here? So it's kind of like, let's just keep moving on this, but I do want to get a response from you. Yeah. I can't remember. It was um, a session. This was like five, six years ago at some um, conference. And he talked about sales reps ending on dead space, yeah. right? Where they answer a question and then they, they, they answer it, right? Oh, how does the API work? Oh, da 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 And what that does, it just gives full control over to the prospect to ask the next question. One of my favorite quotes on influence is the person asking the questions controls the conversation. I love that quote because it's the person asking the questions controls the conversation and reps tend to give control away because they want to get their, you know, the prospect's questions answered, but then they lose control of the conversation, right? If you continue to answer, we, we call the double A, Methodology, answer and ask, answer and ask, answer and ask. Stay in control of the conversation to make sure you either know what the buyer means. Hey, Kevin, how far along are you on this process? Man, I've done X, 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 X. Okay, what are you hoping to see from this? Why do you believe you even need something like this right now? Okay, now we can go, but always have that question ready. Oh, uh, man, I think you and I could have a conversation all day about this shit. Oh, uh, I, I actually got one more question that I'm genuinely curious about from your perspective, because this has always been one I felt a little weird about with my training when it comes to objection handling. Right. So you want to have there's the techniques the feel, felt, found, whatever, you know, the preemptive strike, those type of things. And I think if you use them appropriately, they're, you know, they're all decent in some way, shape or form. But the other thing is, is once you handle an object, once you address an objection, you got to figure out whether that addressed the objection. Like you don't just move on. Right. So what is your advice for your reps when when I have an objection and say, say you'd say, John, this is going to be 350 bucks a month per user. And I'm like, damn, Kevin, that, that's way more expensive than I was expecting. And you say, well, you had said earlier, John, that you were trying to really do this and you appeal to my emotions and the ROI you said that. And so you answer my objection 
Mm-hmm. How do you make the transition to, did that re- like how I now feel about that? Like, do you just straight up ask people? So how does that make you feel? Did that answer your objection? But then you get the kind of the fake, yeah, it did, but you know what I mean? Like, so no, back to the whole topic around this, humanizing sales. Yeah. Yes, I ask it, right? Oh, it's going to be X. Oh, wow, it's way too high. Now, hey, John, you know, what we went over, we were able to show that you're going to at least see a 3X on that. Mm-hmm. Is that not enough to justify the purchase for you? No, it's not. Okay, why not? Right, like, why, why, why not? Let's break this down because if the ROI is not there for you, I don't want you buying either. So when I talk with my team a lot, it's like I'm probably one of the most honest salespeople you'll ever meet, but I just deliver it in the right tonality, right? You can't just say why, right? You can't be like, oh, well, why not? How does that make you feel? Is that too expensive for you? It's like, hey, talk to me here. Right, right. Right. Okay. The objection, oh, that's too much. Okay. Based off the ROI. It does not sound valuable enough, right? Is a three X not enough on that three fifty? I don't know. I need to at least see a five X. Okay. Well, there's a few ways we could maybe show you how we could do that. Could I show you a few other places we could get some leverage? Let me just have that conversation because at that point, though, they clearly don't see the ROI and they may not even want it. Which is why, again, I'm preemptive on making sure you even want it before I bring up the price. I don't need to talk pricing to anybody that doesn't want what I'm selling. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Awesome, man. Well, like I said, I think you and I could probably shoot the shit for for days on end about this stuff because it's it's fun stuff to talk about too, and 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 all about leveling up, right? Like, try how to get that one percent better every day, um, and, and hopefully helping rep skip a few steps and elevate the profession away from the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Boiler Room, Wolf of Wall Street bullshit, right? So. Cool, man. Well, I, I genuinely appreciate you jumping on here, man. I, I love the discussion. Um, tell people how to, you know, get in touch with you or if they got questions or, or you know, service Titan, what's going on there? Yeah. I mean, hit, hit me up on LinkedIn. I don't do Twitter. I actually had to like refine my Facebook login to even make this happen today. So no Instagram or Snapchat or any of that. Find me on LinkedIn. And if you're on the West Coast, we are hiring like crazy right now at Service Titan. So if, if you if this type of selling resonates with you, hit me up. See if there's a position for you here um, because this is the type of stuff that we focus on. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, man, if, uh, if I was coming out of school and looking for a job, there's one thing about the job and the career and the industry and that type of thing. And then there's other thing about leadership and where you can learn the most. So if anybody's out there listening and looking for a place to start their career or kind of get their career to that next level, you got to you got to get in touch with Kevin, at least have a conversation because that the knowledge and, and direction of, of that is is invaluable, in my opinion. So, Kevin, it's been a pleasure, my friends. Let's stay in touch here. Everybody else, thank you all for, so much for listening. And I know this was a little bit longer than the usual one, but I couldn't shut up because I had too many questions for Kevin. So thank you all very much, everybody. Have a great week. All right. Make it happen. Thanks, Kev. Yeah. Bye.